Yeah, I still hear it blowing. Okay, okay, gotcha. Well, we can knock that off. Serving others. Uh, we'll, we'll be in Philippians chapter 2 tonight, talking about a familiar topic, but hopefully something, something new about this, something a little fresh, something a little different that really gets us thinking within the line of, of God, you know, his process of thought. In our society, we typically measure worth by position of wealth. We measure it by power. We measure it by success. You know, who is that person? How, how successful is that individual? Well, they must be of great worth and value, right? They are, they're, they're popular, so they must be of great worth and value. I mean, go to some of these concerts and see some of these individuals standing up and People are bowing to them and shouting out to them and crying over them. Kind of like the old Elvis Presley concerts that you would, you would see on TV, well, that I would see on TV. <laughs> People crying over him, you know. People still do that today. Were some of you at that, Sharon, where you were one of those ladies? <laughs> oh, that's true, that's true. Some of you guys, yeah, you might have been to those concerts, yep. Well, he died in what, 77? Yeah, so I was only a year old, and I, I, hadn't, I haven't been to one, so. <laughs> but we typically measure somebody's worth by wealth, power, success. But did you know that God measures it by the values of his kingdom? such as humility, gentleness, love, those types of things. That's how God measures worth. In the eyes of the world, there are often, these uh, signs are often, um, they, they portray weakness to people rather than strength, don't, don't they? Somebody who's humble is weak. Someone who is gentle is weak. Someone who loves is weak. But God sees it as strength. And I, I think that's a hard concept. When we're constantly being bombarded and, and attacked with a philosophy of, of step on, kick, push people to the side, wealth, power. We're constantly being bombarded by that. It, it's, it's hard to get into the thought process of, of being humble and gentle. But that's what God considers the strength. What images come to your mind when you, uh, when you hear the word servant? What, what pops in your mind when you think of servant? Okay, so doing things for others more than self. Okay, yeah, that's a good definition of servant. What other images pop into your mind when you hear the word servant? like a slave type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, there were uh, many who were servants, but they were servants more out of uh, forced, being forced to be a servant. Yeah, good. Yes. Good image. Somebody washing someone else's feet. That humility. Okay. Yes. Doing whatever was asked. Okay, yeah, that's a good definition too. Yes, John. What's that? Christ-like. Christ -like. Okay, so being like him. So looking at his life in the Gospels, right, and, and kind of watching that. He went to the cross. He was a serve. He served. Uh, he washed the feet. He, he came to serve. Yeah, yeah, good, good, Yes.
Yeah, good. Our missionaries, they, they, they've given up a lot of what we have here in the States. You know, so much of the good that we have here, they've given that up uh, to serve in countries that don't, hardly have nothing. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, so a lot of images pop up in our minds that help us to define what a servant is. So here's the purpose tonight, to understand what it is to serve others from a, from a Christian perspective, all right? So let me read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at a lot of these verses in, in their small little parts. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says this, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete, the apostle says, by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now, verse 1, how would you say verse 1 is an incentive to obey Paul's command in verse 2? How is verse 1 an incentive to obey verse 2? Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So, well, let's, let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at verse 1. If there's any encouragement in Christ, so consider that, any encouragement in Christ. So any person who can be encouraged in that which is of God, if there's any consolation of love, any desire whatsoever to love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, anything that unites us together in Christ, if there's any affection at all, if there's any compassion at all, Paul says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. If there's any of that of verse 1, then be that. Is that what he's saying? If there's any of this, then be this. Well, as Christians, is there any of this? Is there any, what he's saying here, encouragement in Christ? Is there, are any of us ever encouraged as Christians because of Christ? Yes. Okay, so does does he love? Is there any any fellowship with him? Is there any affection and compassion from him? Can we be like that? Yeah, that's what the apostle is saying. This is this was, if there is any of that, then be like that. So. Should we be mean and angry? Should we have a lot of hatred in our heart towards humanity? No. We, we should be like the one who went to the cross. We should be like the one who stepped out of heaven for us. Right, let's, let's develop this a little bit further. Let's look at verses 3 and 4, please. He's, he's an imperative here. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, Paul lays out some commands here in these verses. But do they go against our natural tendencies? <laughs> how, how do they go against our natural tendencies? Okay, so we're selfish. So we don't necessarily want to look out for somebody else's interests. We want to look out for our own interests, right? And, and that's easy to do, isn't it? It's easier to look, for, look at ourselves than it is to others. Absolutely. What else? What else do you see there? How, how, how else do these go against our natural tendencies?
Yeah. Newborn babies, born with that nature, kicking and screaming. So we have, we have that kind of, we, it's easy for us to kick and scream, isn't it? Uh, empty conceit, or he talks about uh, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Is, is that, what, what, is, what is conceit? How would you define conceit? What's that? Puffed up, okay, yeah, self-centered. Pride, all right. So is it, is it natural to show humility or is it more natural, it seems, to be puffed up with pride? Yeah, it seems to be that way, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Right, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Now, now do these... Do any of these go against, like he says here in verse 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Does that go against the spirit of our society? You know what a lot of folks do now when somebody is, is being robbed or attacked? They pull out their phone and they video it. The YouTube is littered with videos from people who have no concern for the well-being of others. They just want to get it on camera so that they can post it on YouTube to get a few followers. And that's something. People, people are getting hurt, and we're just videoing it and making fun of it and laughing at it. For that purpose, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we're not so much interested in other people as much as interested in getting more likes and more recognition. Yeah. So I follow a linguistic guy who is what's called, he's a polyglot. Uh, anybody know what a polyglot is? Polyglot is someone who knows more than four languages, four or more languages, okay? And he's over 20. And he's a gentleman, I think he's in his early, I think he's late 70s. And he is, am, he's really amazing. So I watch him and he just reached a million subscribers. So YouTube gave him this plaque for reaching a million subscribers. Now this guy isn't one of those people who's really focused on himself. And he really is a humble guy. He's just a good guy. Um, but uh, many are aiming for that million followers to get that plaque and then with those million followers you typically get sponsors so you make money there's a lot of money on YouTube that can be made so if you can record for your own purpose you can make money and have recognition Yeah, yeah, God knows all the recognition. Well, I, I use this guy as, a, as an example, but he really, he, he's not one of the guys that, you know, he just sits there and talks about languages and how best to learn. I'm a language fan, so if I can learn something from him, I, I try to do that. And, but it's, it, he just reached one million, so I watched the, you know, he got this plaque, and I thought, man, that's what so many people are aiming for only in life. How would you say that Jesus is the supreme example of humility and servanthood described in these verses here? How, how, how is he kind of the genesis of this and the heartbeat of a servant? What do you see from, from Jesus? Okay, good. So he humbled himself and gave his life for us. There's not much conceit there, is there? It, Notice that Jesus was more focused on us than he was on himself. He didn't have to step out of heaven. That's, a, that's the thing we have to remember. He could have just let us go on our way. <laughs> but he stepped out of what he, of really kind of that, let's see, how can you say this? The only way I can think of is from human terms. He stepped out of that comfort, <laughs> of that throne, and clothed himself in humanity to go through 
um, a, a terrible situation where he ultimately became the sacrifice for humanity, right? But he did that for the purpose to save people's lives. That, that's quite the opposite of conceit. That's quite... Th- yeah, good point. Stepped out of that which was no sin into sin. Yeah. So his obedience to the Father. So even within, within that, there was a humility displayed for the sake of the Father and for the sake of us, for our good. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's look at verse 6 through 8. Let, let's add to this here. Verse 6. Who, although he, Jesus, existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now in these verses, Paul, the apostle here who's writing this, encourages the Philippians, the Christians in Philippi, he encourages them to live, no, excuse me, we'll get to that moment. Let me ask this question. I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself. What did it cost Jesus to be a servant? Let's ask that question first. What did it cost? What? His life. It cost him his life. It cost him stepping out of heaven. It cost him even some, um, some weird relational things that took place when he was on the cross and the father had to turn his head away due to the sin that was placed on him you know, from a hum- humanity perspective. He did. He died, yes. Yeah. But let's break this. I want, I want to show you something here. Let's just break this down just for a little bit. Let's look at verse 6 here. Who was also, let's, no, who although Jesus existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay, yeah. That's, it, it's hard to grasp that. Uh, we're not under, we, don't, we don't grasp, we don't understand uh, in full the depth of the Trinity. It, it's a difficult concept for us. It, you know, it's a difficult concept for me to understand that once my soul leaves my physical body, that this physical body ceases to exist. And that my awareness of, my consciousness of awareness, along with my, my spirit and my physical body, kind of make this one unit. And when one of them leaves, it shuts down the others. That's a hard concept to understand. I don't get all that. Like I don't fully grasp the, the Trinity, but yet there was an, an equalness here. But when Jesus came, he didn't regard that equalness to the degree that he could have when he was on earth. I think of the fact, I think when he was in the garden, and he said he could have a legion of angels come to his side. But he didn't do that. You know, he set a lot of that to the side. Now this, this word, now coming next here, he says, but emptied himself in verse 7, taking the form of a bondservant. That doesn't mean that he emptied himself of deity. You know, God can never cease to be God. Uh, if he could cease to be God, then he wouldn't be God, right? So he doesn't empty himself from the deity, but what he did, in a sense, the best way to do this is he veiled himself. So when Jesus came to earth, there was a veiling when he placed, when he covered himself in this humanity that caused him to walk as a human being walked. Now, of course, he exercised miraculous works, but he didn't show himself in the full glory state that he could have. If he did show himself in the full glory state that he could have, no one could ever look upon him. So he veiled himself, he covered himself. And when he did that, he didn't empty himself of deity, he just restricted himself so that he could walk as a man. So that's why we call him the God-man, the God-man. 100% human, 100% God. So 
kind of just a side note to bring some understanding there. And he did so for the purpose of being a bond servant, a servant. Typically when we read bond servant, now some of your translations are, aren't going to say bond servant. Who, whose translation doesn't say bond servant, just says servant? Okay, what, what translation are you reading from? King James? Okay, yeah, so they're going to say servant. We're, Oh, NLT says slave. Wow, okay, okay, good, good. Uh, anybody else? Does it, anybody else? What slave? What are you reading from? HTMS. Okay, okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. What's that? And, and what are you reading from? NIV, okay. So the, the NASB puts that word bond in there. That word, that word in the original language, the Greek language, is the word doulos. And doulos, based on context, could either mean servant or slave. And sometimes those, those crisscross each other from an interpreting standpoint. We don't, sometimes they don't know if that should be a slave doulos or a servant doulos. So you're going to see that. But typically, when the NASB puts that word bond before it, their intent is a willing servant or a willing slave. That Jesus willingly decided on his own to be a servant. So the New American Standard makes bond servant. They, they write it that way to show that the willingness was there to be a doulos, to be a slave or servant. Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's neat. And wh where from? Just curious. Scotland, okay, yeah. That's neat, that's neat. Thanks for sharing that. Yes? Even, even as a Jew, mother. Yeah, exactly. It was always, always about the Father's will and business. Yes. Good. In, in the Old Testament, if you recall, the, uh, they would have a, a servant of the house, and then once the year Jubilee or something comes up, that that servant would be released from that specific position. And if the servant decided to maintain his current position as a servant because he enjoyed and desired to continue on being a servant of the house, they would put him up next to a a door, and they would stick an awl through his ear. And sometimes they believe that they put a gold ring or something in the ear. And that would indicate that this individual was a servant, uh, a willing servant, and not any other type of servant. Well, when Jesus clothed himself in humanity, he became, he was a willing servant. And like was mentioned by several already, that he did so to obey the Father. He wanted to do this. And verse 8 says, being found in appearance as a man, so that's how they would have seen him, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus had to clothe himself in fl on, with flesh in order to be a sacrifice. You know, from the deity st standpoint, he couldn't sacrifice that. He had to sacrifice from a humanity standpoint. And he had to sacrifice within, wait, let's see here. He had to sacrifice, well, let me say it this way. What he was sacrificing for, he had to wear. Okay, so if he came for the birds, <laughs> he would have to have clothed himself as a bird, right? <laughs> yeah. But he came, to, he came to give his life to human beings, so he had to clothe himself in humanity. Now, just a really side note, and I don't want to get on a rabbit trail too much, but I've, I've get asked, I get asked all kinds of questions, right? Because this is what we do. We ask questions. Uh, we, all, we ask each, each other questions to figure things out. Well, I've been asked about aliens, right? Especially right now, because with, with our government, and have you seen that on the news a lot? People are asking the government, you know, what's happening right now is that uh, a lot within our, many within our military who are flying drones or aircraft are seeing all these weird phenomena in the air. 
So the question is, and they're recording this, and they're showing it on YouTube and places like that, and they're getting those followers. But the big question is, so it, are there UFOs? You know, these UFO aliens, UFOs. So I get asked the question often, are there aliens? So I, let's just back this up for a moment. When Adam and Eve sinned, all of creation at that moment was then tainted by sin. Everything. Way out, all, you know, the, the areas out in space that we can't even see was all tainted by sin. So as a result, everything's in a state of entropy, right? It, it's declining, it's degrading. Everything is, that's what sin does, it degrades, it kills. Jesus came to earth and clothed himself as a human being. Because a human being was the one thing that was made in God's image that will exist forever somewhere. He didn't come as a E.T. He didn't come as any of that. He came as a human being. And that reminds me that human beings, how special we are, that he didn't clothe himself in anything but us. And that, that gives me a little bit of a reminder that there's no life form out there. That, now, there, you can have a solar wind come and pick up some bacteria and blow it on Mars, maybe, but it would be dead. And you would find it on Mars, but it came from Earth. But the point is this. He came for humanity. And, it, and he said this, that he died once and for all. Right? The most important thing to him are human beings because we are the only thing in all of existence that will exist somewhere. So he humbled himself and clothed himself in humanity and went to the cross for us. There was a purpose for Jesus coming. When I think of being a servant, I think of the purpose. There's got to be a purpose behind it. Why would any Christian want to serve someone else? Do we do it just arbitrarily? Do we do it by accident? No, there's got to be a purpose. And that purpose must have in it to some degree that people are worth it, that people are valuable, that people are important. That if God would step out of hev heaven and only clothe himself in humanity tells us that people are pretty special. So what is it that would drive us to serve somebody else? What is it that would cause us to be humble for the sake of somebody else? What would cause us to love someone else and to care, someone el care for someone else? It's got to be that people are of worth and value. It's got to be. And that worth and value Having that mindset, according to God, is strength. Strength. You want to be a strong individual? See the worth and value in other people. And may that be the purpose that drives you to want to serve them. Because that's what God did. He saw the treasure. He saw the worth and value. And he clothed himself. And that worth and value wasn't anything that we had to give him. Like, our, the worth and value wasn't because of us. It was because he made us in his image. And that was the worth and value. Because we butchered that in Genesis 3. <laughs> we, we really didn't have any worth or value. But God said, that was something made in my image, and it is important to me. It's a treasure of mine, and I want it back. So he clothed himself in humanity. So when I think of being a servant... From a biblical perspective, I think there has to be a purpose. And that purpose is the worth and value of people. You see? That's what drives it. Let's look at verses 12 through 18. Any questions before we move on? Into verse 12 and 3. I know I'm talking a lot here. but This is an important subject. Very, very important subject, right? Okay. All right. Let's look at verse 12 through 18. It reads, because we're going to skip over here. We went 6 to 8, now I'm just jumping to 12 to 18. It says, So then, my beloved 
just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Now, if you remember, this is a prison epistle, right? Philippians says. The Apostle Paul is locked up. He's doing a two-year stint in Rome when he wrote this. That's why he says at the end here, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice or sacrifice of service of your faith, he's saying because of sharing the gospel, because of me pouring into people's lives, I'm locked up in prison. And if you, you remember how he got there, right? Anybody remember how he got locked up the first time? Jerusalem? Yeah. Yeah, he was testifying to the truth. He was being a servant to people, and they didn't like it. He was recognizing their worth and value and that Jesus went to the cross for, the, for them. And he ended up into, in this huge battle, uh, verbal battle, and next thing you know, he's, he, he goes and appeals before Caesar. He gets locked up for two years. It's more of a house arrest. He eventually gets let loose, and then he gets in trouble again later on, and that's when he wrote 2 Timothy, and, and he, gets, he is beheaded by Emperor Nero. But right now, he does eventually get let, he, he's let loose. Now, in these verses, Paul encourages the Philippians to live godly lives. In what way is he, the apostle, a model of servanthood for them? Imagine yourself a Christian in Philippi during this time period in the first century, okay, in the 50, late 50s, early 60s. So you're a Christian, at the, well, early 60s at this point. You're a Christian, you're in Philippi, the Apostle Paul is um, locked up in, on house arrest right now under imprisonment, and he writes you this letter. In what way is he a, a, a model of what a servant is? What do, what do you see in Paul? You know, right here, based on these verses here, what do you see? What encourages you? Yes. Oh, Yes. Yeah. Perseverance. Yeah. This guy has been in, in was it Lystra? They threw rocks at him and threw him out of the city. They stoned him. In Ephesus, he had to leave because they kept shouting, Great is Artemis. In Damascus, he was he had to escape over the side of the wall in a basket. I mean, this guy, he, he goes through imprisonment, he goes through shipwrecks, he gets beaten by the Jews, uh, whipped by them. Uh, you can imagine how many times he was probably spit on. And he, it's understood that he likely had malaria, and that's probably why he couldn't see. Maybe the rocks being thrown at him all the time could, could, could have played a part in that. Um, they, the ancient or the early church fathers they describe him as a, as a really um, ugly guy who couldn't speak well. Um, I mean, there was nothing really good about this guy when you would see him from a distance. He didn't have any money. He didn't have any, any uh, real fame, right? If you walked anywhere with this guy, you always had to watch. <laughs> you always had to look around. You didn't walk. If you walked with the Apostle Paul down a Roman road, you had to be careful who was coming. And it could be Roman soldiers. It was definitely going to be the Jews because they hated this guy for what he was doing. And he was, a, and he was one of them. He was a Pharisee at one point. I mean, he's not a very popular guy. He's got nothing. But he was very persistent in preaching the gospel because he understood the worth and value of people. He knew what was going to happen to people 
if they didn't hear the gospel and surrender over to Jesus? Yes. His testimony was well known. <laughs> Let me show you how, look, look at this. I didn't, I didn't tell Pat this, but chapter one here. If you want to jump back to chapter one, I want to show you something here. Uh, it might take me just a moment. Let me see here. Where are you? Oh, come on. Where are you? Oh, where is it? Hold on one second. Might have to. Okay. Nope. Boy, I cannot remember where. Oh, here. Okay. Look, look at verse 12 here. Chapter 1, verse 12. He says, now I want you to know, brethren... Now, remember, he, he's, he's on house arrest. Being on house arrest, he's literally, I think it's like a 12 or 18 inch chain is how they did this. A Roman guard was with him 24 hours and they would rotate, all right? <laughs> I love this. He said, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Okay, first question, you're locked up, Paul. Do you understand that you can't go to McDonald's? You can't go to Walmart. You can't do anything. And he says, hold it, it's turned out for the good. Okay, how's that? So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. The whole Praetorian Guard. All those Roman guards that were watching him, that were doing shifts, they all heard the gospel of Jesus. And he said, hey, they've all heard. When they, have take, when they took Paul, because there were times that Paul would go before um, Caesar or whatever, Paul would proclaim the gospel in the palace of the emperor. And then he says, everyone else has heard also. Kind of like whoever, if somebody walked by his window, he'd say, hey, come on over here. Let me tell you about Jesus. The prison epistles that he wrote, they were all written with a Roman guard attached to his hand. I mean, come on. In verse 14, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Because of my imprisonment, because of standing fast in Jesus Christ and not giving up, the rest of the Christians around here are encouraged. You know, they thought they were doing, they thought they were shutting this man up. They were just making him speak louder. Huh? Huh? They did. They gave him a bullhorn, and he was shouting it out. Everybody was hearing it. Like very, a very captive audience at that. But what was the purpose? See, I always have to go back to the purpose. What was the purpose of him serving other people, even when he lost his freedom? What was the purpose? It was the serving God, the will of God, the worth and value of other people. Yes. You, we call Philippians the book of joy. He, he was locked up in, on house arrest when he wrote it. Never complained. Never complained. Yes, John. It was worth it to him. Absolutely. All right, let's go chapter 2, 19 through 21. Let's read this. 19 through 21. And, now, and, and before we read this, to keep in mind, guys, the Apostle Paul is just a person like any one of us. There's nothing, this guy was not a superhero. Like there's nothing special. He's not Superman, no, no, nothing like that. He's a human being, just like, just like us. But he had a drive in him that many of us today don't have. Verse 19, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Now Paul contrasts Timothy with others, doesn't he? Did you see how he did that? They, their interest is themselves. Timothy's interest is that which interests 
Jesus. Isn't that cool? If Timothy were alive today, how might would you say that his genuine concern for the welfare of others being lived out in practical ways? If Timothy were alive today, how, how would he live out his genuine concern for others in a very practical way? What, what would you expect to see in Timothy? What's that? Evangelizing, not too concerned about his own welfare, but concerned about others. Providing for others, looking out for their, their interest. Yeah. Maybe the long treacherous road to Philippi, because Timothy was visiting Paul in Rome. Paul was allowed to have some visitors. And Paul or Timothy was there. Timothy ends up taking the letter, right? Taking some letters to different places. So Timothy had to travel. Now, wouldn't it be easier just to, just to go home and sit on the couch? You mean I have to walk all the way over there? For what? What am I going to get out of this? Okay, what am I going to get by going to Philippi? Like, they're, a, they're a brand new church. They don't have any money, hardly. They gave some to the Apostle Paul, but I don't think I'm going to get any of that. Um, fame, glory, not from these guys. What am I going to get? I'm going to wear out my shoes. I'm going to have to face robbers and the weather. Who knows what kind of weather it's going to be like out there. I mean, you know, I'm walking through the desert. How many snakes do I have to watch out for? What about the wild animals? I mean, think about that. John, did you have something? Were you going to say something? I would say, I would say so. All right, let's look at verses 25 through 30. 25 through 30. says, But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed... He was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him. And not on, not on him only, but also on me, so that I would have sorrow upon sorrow. I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be, be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ." risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. So Epaphroditus, is also, he also heads on over to Philippi. And just in those short words, did you see the kind of life Epaphroditus was going through at this moment? He was sick, close to death, God had mercy, and then when he bounced out, when he bounced back, what, what, was, what did he do? He, he wanted to serve people. Like his whole mission was serving people. His whole mission was sharing the gospel or, or dry, uh, bringing a letter to the church in Philippi. Paul says, receive him, receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold people like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, they demonstrated this type of lifestyle. They were servants. And I think that I always go back to, they weren't superheroes. They were average Joes like, like anyone. But they had a purpose. And that purpose fueled their service to others. So when I look at serving others, it always drives me, drives me right back to purpose. So I have to ask, you know, what is your purpose? 
What is your purpose? If you're alive, and I, all of you are, nobody's slipped away from me tonight, then you can have a purpose. I can have a purpose. We don't have to worry about missing out on the purpose thing until we, you know, when we leave earth, we'll have a new purpose, right? And that purpose will be glorifying God right in front of him. But right now, what is our purpose other than glorifying God? What is our purpose at this moment? What is, what is God placed in our heart to do, to be motivated with? What, what, what is his desire for us? Jesus stepped out of heaven. heaven. His purpose was to fulfill the will of the Father by clothing himself in humanity and serving other people. What was Timothy's purpose? What was Paul's purpose? What was Epaphroditus' purpose? What was their purpose? What was our purpose? Purpose, the right purpose, drives servanthood. And that's what God sees as strength. Yes, Bill? Purpose? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's joy in that. It helps drive the purpose. Yes. Whatever the Spirit is guided, that, that's the purpose, to be about his work, his business. Okay, good. Yes, Paul. Yeah. So when we come to Christ, we become a new creation in Christ, right? That he might have a relationship with us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he went to the cross for us in spite of our sin, right? I mean, he, he didn't have to do that. As born again Christians, God had, when we when the Holy Spirit came within us, we were given a very clear and distinguished purpose, right? To enjoy God, to glorify Him, to honor Him, and to follow the example of Jesus. That purpose is the drive that causes us to serve. Yes. That's part of, you, you really can't serve with, without there being that, that focus on, on genuine, authentic loving of, of someone else, can you? I mean, what's the purpose of serving someone if you don't like them? For prestige? You get paid, there you go. Exactly. Okay. Well, serving others. How do we serve others? I think it's driven by purpose. Jesus served because he had a purpose. I think we ought to follow that example. Let me, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for helping us to understand more of what it is to serve. I think it's one of those easy words to say, but um, it's difficult to do. I can't imagine, um, I, you know, when you, when you, Jesus, came to earth, and all the mess you had to go through, um, you know, to me it'd be easy just to back out of that. But you, you were driven. You were driven not only to obey the Father, but you were driven because 
of your concern, your love for human beings. You knew that because of our sin, we were doomed eternally. And you came to change that. So first, Lord, we thank you for what you did. Thank you for not giving up and thank you for not turning back. You could have done that, but you didn't. You, you kept the course and now because of your servanthood, we can have eternal life. We can be washed clean when we look to the cross. Lord, may, well, we can't do that for others because only you, God, can do that. But may we emulate that servanthood attitude that you had to other people. And maybe we can give and change their lives around in the, in the power of, of your word and your strength and your might, of course. So thank you for helping us to hear and to understand. May it change us. May it change us. In Jesus' name. Amen.